Audible Originals presents The Wonderland Murders and the Secret History of Hollywood. First, a program note. The following podcast includes adult situations and language. Your client murdered those people, had those people murdered. I heard it. I saw it. That man is a murderer right there. Sitting in a cell in the Los Angeles County Jail and facing the possibility of years in prison for robbery, Scott Thorson decided to become a witness against a powerful drug dealer named Eddie Nash. Thorson reached out to LAPD detectives to tell them he was there the night Nash sent his henchmen out to a house on Wonderland Avenue where four people were beaten to death in one of the bloodiest murders in the history of a city that was known by its murders. It was the summer of 1988, seven years after the murders on Wonderland Avenue. Thorson was drug addicted and by his own admission, a drug dealer himself. The detectives had to decide whether his story was true and whether he would be seen as believable by a jury of 12. I'm Michael Connolly, and you're listening to The Wonderland Murders and The Secret History of Hollywood. In this episode, we will tell the story of how Scott Thorson, once famous as the companion of flamboyant Las Vegas showman Liberace, would reemerge in the media limelight as the star witness in the case, take on all doubters, and then be the cause of his own and the case's undoing. It seems to me that almost everybody I talked to who was on the side of law enforcement said the same thing about this case. You know, when a crime is committed in hell, you don't have angels for witnesses. When a murder is committed in hell, you don't have angels as witnesses. And that saying seems to sum up Scott Thorson and his prospects as a witness perfectly. He's no angel. But despite his flaws and vulnerabilities as a witness, the detectives and the prosecutors came to a unanimous conclusion. This is retired detective Mac McLean. Yeah, Scott Thorson was the, was the only reason that case rejuvenated because they, they never closed the case, but if you don't have any evidence to go on, it just goes dormant until, somebody, until you get new evidence, and that's what happened. Scott was the one who prompted, you know, hey, we could open this back up. And this is Tom Lang, the lead detective on the case through its many twists and turns through the justice system. So he was about the only one so-called insider who we could actually ask questions of. And under repeated questioning, the insider told the story of being inside Eddie Nash's house on the night he dispatched the killers to Wonderland Avenue. Uh, He stuck by his story and... uh, uh, Basically, I think he was telling us a lot of factual things. Still, Lang said, with informants, you always proceed cautiously. He said he overheard this, he overheard that. You know, he can always throw a little something in there. It's like any witness in a murder case, you never interview somebody once. You're interviewing two, three, four times. And if each time they enhance their story, you know, well, maybe this isn't going to be the best of witnesses. But much of what he said, he repeated. So there was something there. You believe everything he says? No. He did have a credible story to that extent. Um, So, uh, yeah, again, there were little things that he wouldn't have known about that uh, were that he came out with first that we really couldn't corroborate. But he must, he's must he got to know something. Well, unfortunately, of course, uh, Scott still had his cocaine problem. And he was going to be a tough witness. But that, combined with all of the other things that we had, some of it circumstantial, some of it not, um, 
we felt that we could probably go ahead and uh, go after Nash and Dials, and, and uh, that's what happened. Lang and McLean took the discovery of the insider to the district attorney's office. Two new prosecutors were assigned to the case, Dale Davidson and Carol Nahara. They vetted Thorson and reviewed the evidence accumulated previously in the case against John Holmes. This is what Carol Nahara told the podcast about vetting Scott Thorson. He presented a unique set of challenges because as a prosecutor, you never want to knowingly and you won't ever put on someone that you don't believe is credible. The thing with Scott Thorson is the thing that, that Dale and I and with the help of Tom and Mac painstakingly did was when whenever he talked about an event, he'd go into detail and we would try to confirm with objective factors all of the details that he put in. And whenever something didn't work, didn't make sense, and actually it didn't happen very often, then of course it would be investigated thoroughly because the one thing was that, well, he, he's, when you say he's an embellisher and a good storyteller, I wouldn't call him an embellisher so much as he, he tells, he doesn't, how would I put this? When he tells a story or when he tells events, he makes it sound like a story. In other words, he's basically writing a novel in his mind all the time. And that doesn't necessarily mean that he isn't actually telling the truth. It just means that his way of communicating is more flamboyant, more theatrical, more um, creative than what we, we look at in the law. The law, we're very dry. We're boring. We ask yes or no questions. We, you know, tell the uh, witnesses to say as little as possible and just stick to the stick to answering the questions very carefully. He when you ask him, it's the classic, the classic, I'm going to use this, it's been used many times, but it's the classic example of you ask somebody the time and they tell you how to build a watch. He's that kind of a storyteller. So he, I don't know if it's fair to call him unreliable or an embellisher, but definitely he tells the story and he tells it like he's, like I said, you only want to know what happened and he will tell you everything about what led up to it. And, that, and of course, when he's telling the story, it's part of his life. And so it, he tends to see his life as more dramatic or more flamboyant than perhaps those of us who are watching his life would think it was. Meanwhile, Lang and McLean look for the other witnesses from that previous case. David Lynn, one of the robbers who humiliated Eddie Nash, was a key part of the first case, and he was now located in a jail cell in Redding, California, where he was facing drug and auto theft charges. Once again... They had no angels as witnesses. He's up and ready and gets, gets arrested. We need him as a witness. I had to go up there, talk to the people up there, and get him out of jail. Uh, again, you deal with these people, but you need them to testify. But it really put, puts you in a bad position when they're getting in trouble because you, you need them. Ultimately, it was decided to move forward with the case against Eddie Nash and his bodyguard, Greg Dials. An internal memo written by Davidson, which was in support of charging Nash and Dials, indicates the case would lean heavily on the testimony of Thorson. Davidson declined a request to talk to the podcast, but we have actor Scott Clace here to read from parts of the prosecution memo. This witness first came to the attention of the Los Angeles Police Department investigators in August of 1988. Thorson will testify that he was at Nash's home some hours after Nash and Dials had been victims of a robbery involving money, guns, and drugs. Nash was furious. Thorson will also testify that he heard John Holmes being beaten and threatened. He will further testify that he observed Nash order Dials and two others to take Holmes to the Wonderland house and get back his cocaine and money. Thorson's acquaintance and relationship with Nash can be independently corroborated. The memo also has a section labeled Special Problems, and Thorson was listed here as well. The male victims in this case and the majority of the witnesses have criminal records themselves. Witness Thorson has pled guilty to a robbery of a narcotics dealer and is pending sentencing on that case. But more so than the pedigree of their witnesses, the prosecutors expressed a concern in the memo about foreseeable defenses to the charges. The male victims, Lonius and Deverell, were heavily involved in criminal activity at the time of these murders. 
Each had extremely large heroin habits, which they were supporting by committing burglaries and robberies. The expected defense tactic will be to attempt to show other individuals who had grudges against these victims and motives to kill them. Because many of our witnesses have criminal records themselves, a general attack on the credibility of our witnesses is to be expected. Still, the recommendation at the end of the memo was to go forward with the case and seek justice for the victims of the Wonderland Massacre. The crime scene in this case is one of the most gruesome in Los Angeles County history. It is the senseless slaughter of the female victims that is particularly offensive about these crimes. It seems abundantly clear that any man, woman, and or child that was inside the Wonderland residence when the killers entered was going to die. An incredibly strong motive had to exist behind this slaughter. While many of the pieces of our evidence are subject to individual attack, when viewed collectively, it is my belief that the evidence is sufficient to conclusively prove the guilt of both Nash and Dials to any 12 reasonable jurors. It is my recommendation that four counts of murder and one count of attempted murder be filed against both potential defendants, as well as murder special circumstances as to each. That last part about special circumstances meant that they would go for the death penalty upon conviction. At the time, California was using the gas chamber at San Quentin to put people to death. The internal memo was prescient on at least two levels. One was that the credibility of witnesses would be attacked as expected, but the reference to the case being proven beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 reasonable jurors would prove to be painful to those involved in prosecuting the case. Soon after the decision was made to move forward, Nash and Dials were arrested and jailed. Over the next two years, Nash would cycle through several of the top defense attorneys in the city. Trial prep would wind through 1989 before the case would move into court in 1990. There was also the business of Scott Thorson that needed to be worked out. In order to testify, Thorson wanted a deal on the charges he faced, and he wanted protection. Though, as I said earlier in the podcast, it is impossible to go to the U.S. Marshal's office to confirm whether someone is in witness protection, newspaper accounts from that time say that Thorson was indeed in the Federal Witness Protection Program, and at least one other person outside of Thorson himself confirmed it as well. Detective Mac McLean said he was the one who delivered Thorson into the hands of the U.S. Marshals with the program like something from a movie you knock on the door who is it uh, this is a detective mclean i'm bringing in so and so and then they scan the camera on you and, and they let us in we drop him off and they says don't try to get in contact with him he goes we're going to take him and put him somewhere and if you want to contact you have to contact us so they gave me a number where we could contact him they would in turn contact him if we needed uh needed thoughts to testify we couldn't directly have any kind of conversation with him. As again, we didn't, we had no idea where he was at. So when, when I said bye to him that day, I didn't know where the heck he was going to be, you know, for the next few months and didn't hear anything from him until we need him and we went to trial. And so I called the, uh, we needed to interview him one more time. So I called the marshals. They said, okay, he's going to be at this location. It was a different state. He's going to be at this location, this hotel at this time. And, uh, and that's how we met him to interview him. Thorson said he was taken to Washington, D.C., where he went through a training and indoctrination program for people starting over with new identities and in new geographic locations. They have all these apartments underground, and they have all these protective witnesses there getting new identity. And they take you in. They says, OK, what name do you want to be called? Okay, this is what you have to do. This is your new social. This is this and that. It's like something out of the movies. 
He says when he was asked to pick a new name, he chose one he had heard often while in L.A. Jess Marlowe was the name of a local news anchor, but the deputy marshals he submitted it to in Washington, D.C. were unfamiliar with the name and approved it. And Jess Marlowe came on TV one night. You know, I heard that name. Jess Marlowe. I said, that's what I'll call myself, Jess Marlowe. Later, the real Jess Marlowe would be very upset when he learned that Thorson had appropriated his name. He explored legal remedies, but the new Jess Marlowe was never forced to change his name. Thorson, as Jess Marlowe, was eventually moved to Tallahassee, Florida, where he was placed in a halfway house for recovering addicts run by a local preacher. When he was needed to testify in the Nash trial, he would be pulled out and sent back, escorted by federal agents until handed off to the LAPD. Before Nash went on trial, an associate of his and Scott Thorson's also faced the justice system. James Doc Holliday, the high-ranking member of the Black Gorilla family who Thorson had forged a cocaine distribution deal with, was convicted in federal court of running a drug empire in Los Angeles. He, along with a partner, were sentenced under a federal law that at the time required mandatory life sentences because they had been convicted of operating a continuing criminal enterprise. The law was a tool used by the federal government to help stem the tide of the crack epidemic. At his sentencing, Holiday did not ask for the court's mercy. Instead, he told the court that it was the condition of society that produces people such as myself. We accept this sentence and we stand in front of the court and say, well, like... See you next time. But for Doc Holliday, there would be no next time. 46 years old at the time of his sentencing, he would die in a federal supermax prison more than 28 years later. The murder trial of Eddie Nash and Greg Diles began in early 1990. This case is a case of revenge. It's a case of a man's ego that couldn't stand for what happened. He couldn't allow this to happen in the circles that he moves. Um, that man was unmanned and humiliated by this, and he was going to get even. That was Prosecutor Dale Davidson. His colleague, Carol Nahara, also addressed the jury during the trial, likening the murders allegedly ordered by Nash to a terrorist act. And he sent his thugs over there like a terrorist raid. And they went into that house, and ladies and gentlemen, they proceeded to bludgeon and bash in the brains of every individual who was in that house. Though the long-awaited case drew constant headlines, the main event was Scott Thorson's dramatic testimony before a packed courtroom. I, I learned that Mr. Nash had been robbed and he was extremely angry. I heard Mr. Nash threatening Mr. Holmes, telling Mr. Holmes that he would have every member in his family killed. And uh, John was uh, begging for his life. Uh, I heard furniture being uh, like a body being knocked around on walls. She ordered Mr. Dials to take Mr. Holmes up the street to Wonderland Avenue to get back his drugs and money. When cross-examined under blistering attack from the defense, Thorson refused to back off his claim to have been in Nash's house, dramatically pointing across the courtroom at Nash and Dials at the defense table. Your client murdered those people, had those people murdered. I heard it, I saw it, I saw Mr. Dials and Mr. Holmes and there isn't anything you can do and say that I'm lying now. That man is a murderer right there. 
The investigators on the case said they were happy with Thorson. This is Tom Wang. Uh, I think he was a very effective witness. And this is Mac McLean. The, the defense attorney, Leslie Averson, I remember her telling me, I'm going to eat your witness up. He's a liar. She tells, I'm sitting out in front of the court. She comes sit down beside me, starts telling me that. You know, you got a lying witness. You know, he's, you know, he's a, he's a jailhouse informant. I'm going to eat him up alive. But what was funny, because she, I goes, yeah, I said, well, we'll see, Leslie. So what was funny that when Scott Thorson got up on the stand, he was very, very believable. He was very good. So. The trial lasted three months before being submitted to the jury. But after only three days of deliberations, the judge received a note from the foreman. The note said the jury was hopelessly deadlocked. 11 votes for guilt, one for acquittal. The judge told the jury to keep trying, but less than a day later, the foreman reported it was no go, and the judge declared a mistrial. He ordered Nash and Dials to continue to be held without bail while the DA decided whether to retry the case. The judge gave the prosecution a month to make that decision, but it took less than a day before the DA announced that Nash and Dials would be retried. Meanwhile, the prosecution team was baffled by the decision of the one juror to hold out for acquittal. She was an 18-year-old woman who told newspaper reporters that she did not believe the state had proved guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution team thought there had been something else behind the juror's holdout. We knew, because it was 11-1. We knew when we found it, we knew that there, were, that there was a problem and we felt that she had been paid off. And the thing that got is that she was like 18 years old and we were reluctant, Tom and I were reluctant, uh, we were reluctant that she should even be on the jury. But one of the DAs says, oh no, this 18 year old girl, the other witnesses, I mean, the other jurors who were older, I had a lot of older women, they're gonna take her up under their arms and she's got to do everything you said. Well, he, this DA who said that didn't have any kids. We had kids. I goes, no, you don't know kids. I goes, these, you know, they can be very stubborn and uh, rebellious. And I goes, I don't think that's the case. So we didn't want to put her on the jury initially. But it was overruled because we don't get the final decision. So that they said, no, we're going to put her on there. So it didn't, it didn't surprise me when they started saying that she was the one holding up the jury. As a matter of fact, I was told by one of the, I think it was the jury uh, uh, foreman, he even tried to persuade her. I think he took her out to, to lunch or something to try to talk to her. And she said, this is what the foreman told me. He goes, well, it, he may get convicted, but it won't be about by this jury. That's what I was uh, told that she had said. So we go, we, th- we think she's, she's bought. So we were trying to, find if there was any money she had gotten access to all of a sudden to try to uh, uh, to see if she had a lot of money went into her accounts or something, but never could prove it. Here is Prosecutor Carol Nahara. I would have sworn that we had that one nailed in. I was convinced they were going to come back with a complete conviction, uh, unanimous verdict on everything. And I was, I was shocked when it was the holdout, and I was shocked who the holdout was because as a prosecutor, you learn – a few things when you're reading a jury. And usually if you have a holdout, one holdout when 11 other people are that strong, it's usually someone who you, you saw, you see the red flags after the fact, you didn't see that there was some quirk or some eccentricity about them that you didn't notice before, but then you realize, Oh yes, we should have seen that. That's our mistake. She didn't exhibit any, any of those eccentricities, any of those quirks, any of those things that would make you think, wait a minute, why is this person given this, profile of her of who she was the best we could profile with the uh, jury um, questionnaires she didn't in any way exhibit anything before during or after the trial that would have made you think she could be the one lone holdout so it didn't make sense it was an anomaly it was an outlier and that I think is why the investigating officer suspected something wasn't right well did you uh join in that suspicion um Mac McLean told us that uh he and Tom Wang, you know, did some investigative work afterwards to see if they could figure out if she was paid off. And, and they never, at least with their investigation, they never found anything. They, at the time that it happened, 
they almost immediately started voicing those concerns. And quite honestly, uh, Dale Davidson, who was my partner on this case, and I, when they, when as soon as they said it, it almost like everything clicked into place and it made perfect sense. There, there had to have been some other factor introduced to make that result, because it just, it just doesn't fit into the parameters of people like us who have done hundreds of jury trials and get some feel for a jury, get some feel where as your case is going, you realize, okay, my case is going south. I realize that there's going to be issues. None of that happened here. And that's why we suspected that there had to have been some other force or some other element that was introduced to cause this result. The suspicions didn't end there. And we'll have more about that verdict and the juror who held out in the next episode of the podcast. The team regrouped and focused on the retrial. It began less than a year later, and the prosecution followed the same course as before. After all, they had convinced 11 out of 12 jurors that Nash was behind the slaughter. The attorneys for Nash and Dials offered what is called a third-party culpability defense, meaning they were pointing the finger at somebody else. And that somebody was one of those many figures from the Hollywood underworld who had come up in the now years-long investigation a convicted drug dealer who had bragged to an ex-girlfriend about being one of the killers in the Wonderland case. The detectives had investigated the man and dismissed his so-called confession as a false claim meant to impress or threaten the ex-girlfriend. But there he was in the police files turned over to the defense as part of the discovery. He became the defense's straw man. He was brought to court from prison to testify, but he took the fifth. All this made the testimony of Scott Thorson more important to the state's case because he was the insider who was there when Nash sent his people to Wonderland. Once again, he was brought back to L.A. from his location in witness protection to testify. The LAPD put him in a hotel under 24-hour security just two blocks from the courthouse. He was set to begin his testimony on a Monday morning, and then things went sideways. But when we brought him back, um, we had to keep him protected. So we had policemen uh, from robbery homicide, their job was to protect him, was to keep him guarded. We had him on the 24 hour cover and they had a joining room. Uh, the detectives were in one room, they had a door in between them and then they had Thorson in the other room. Their job was to keep it, uh, keep it on. We, gotta keep the, we rotated all of these detectives from robbery homicide guarding this guy. And so, they wake up, they, the joining door, this, the door between his room, they, they go there and it's locked. They knock on the door, he won't open the door. They go around to the, to, the, to the front door, knock on the front door, he doesn't answer there. So they finally get a key, I think, from the management, and they find out that he's, uh, they go that he's gone. They have no idea where he's at. So he escapes. So I get a call from the DA. I'm on my way, she goes, you guys lost uh, lost Thorson. I goes, what do you mean they lost him? He goes, he's gone. I goes, you kidding me? The detectives did not know whether Thorson had disappeared under his own volition or not. They started searching for him. He slips by the guards and takes off, uh, hits the streets, ends up down on Skid Row looking for cocaine in the middle of the night. He's gone all night. We're out looking for him. And he comes back about daybreak. And, you know, he scored and everything else. The prosecutors decided it was too risky to put Thorson on the stand. The DA didn't want to put him up on the stand because he come, you know, we got him back. He was willing to still go up there and testify. But they just they were just afraid that no, we're going to go there. He's, he's lost credibility. McLean explained that the concern was that the defense attorneys would more than likely ask Thorson about his drug use, which would go to his credibility as a witness. He might even be asked when he had last used drugs. It was a road leading to disaster with a witness. It was too risky. And besides that, it would be unethical for the prosecutors to knowingly let a witness lie on the stand. As long as he was with us, he was clean. But now he's out of, we're out of sight of him. We don't know what he's doing. Right. So we figured he was probably getting drugs and all that. Because when he came back, he came back with, you know, with this, this lie about you know, why he, he left and all this type of thing. And again, to be honest with you, I still would have taken the chance because we needed him to testify. But the DA goes, no, we, no, he's lost credibility. We can't do it. So that was it. 
This was seen in hindsight by some as a critical blow to the prosecution. I asked Thorson about it, and he told me that he didn't escape police protection to buy drugs and get high. He said it was because he felt threatened. He said living in a new place with a new name did not insulate him from Eddie Nash. He believed the accused mastermind of the killings could get to him anywhere, and police protection didn't matter when Nash was so well-connected. I took off. And what were you doing? I was scared. And were you trying to get drugs or what? No. I knew where to go to get drugs. I just got... I got really nervous. I got. Uh, I, well, you had I got, already testified once. Yeah, but I got it. I uh, I got a message. What was that? I was not supposed to be testifying. So you're in police protection. How did you get? How did they get a message to you? This is before in Tallahassee. As both Lang and McLean have told me, his story is hard to believe. You feel threatened and you duck out of around-the-clock police protection only to return in the morning? That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? No, no. That was never anything. Thorson was more afraid than anything because he was, he was afraid. He was terrified of, uh, of uh, Nash. And he thought that if Nash got worried that he was going to be testifying that he would be killed. So that was the whole reason for it. But the whole time that we were guarding him, and sometimes I would go out with the detectives who was guarding him, like they took him to get lunch or go to dinner or something, I would go with them and still try to pick his brain to could he remember anything else. I never seen anything at all that showed that somebody was trying to kill him, nothing. But he was terrified that it was, and so we took that seriously, and so that's why we gave him the protection we did. Either way, the state's case was undisputedly damaged by the loss of Thorson, and I think the proof of this was in the verdict. The state did get a unanimous verdict this time, but it was a unanimous vote for acquittal. Eddie Nash slapped both hands down on the defense table when the verdict was read. If Thorson had testified, I think we'd have got, we would not have gotten an acquittal. That's yeah. my opinion. As one, one of the DAs, one of the initial DAs said, there is no angels in, in hell. When these things happen, it's very discouraging. But you still do what you got to do. You still do what you got to do. You don't throw in the towel. Oh, I feel bad about this. Life is messy. And it doesn't get any messier than murder. And it doesn't get any messier sometimes when you try to go after those people who murder especially people who have money and influence, because they're going to try their damnedest to get out of it. Carol Nehera, who became a Superior Court judge after a 31-year career as a prosecutor, does not put the acquittal solely on the shoulders of Scott Thorson. By the time of the second trial, Nash had spent two years in the county jail and looked old and frail. He didn't appear to be the fearsome gangster the prosecution and its witnesses were trying to say he was. The second trial had so many things go south on us. Uh, There's so many left turns in that second trial that to try to say any one thing is the reason that we had, that we ended up with the result that we did is almost, almost isn't even fair to Scott Thorson. The whole tone and tenor of the trial was different. Basically, in the first trial, there was a palpable fear of Eddie Nash that came through to the jury from all of the witnesses who testified. In the second trial, and yet with Scott Thorson, he seemed less in fear of him. In the second trial, the witnesses seemed more empowered because of the verdict in the first trial, and no one seemed afraid of him anymore. They all thought he was going to be convicted. And so the fact, so then he, you're, the jury is seeing this old man who looks harmless and a bunch of, of his associates, which aren't, you know, the, the best people looking fearless around him. And then you have Scott Thorson, who's now acting like he's more afraid. So it, it was, I think that whole dynamic is what basically torpedoed the case the second time around. Um, Scott Thorson running away. Honestly, I've had worse things happen in trials. And honestly, it doesn't really do 
it doesn't really, the fact that he ran away or, or he left for a day, whether, for whatever reason, the fact of the matter is he went away. In terms of how relevant that is to the trial or what he has to testify to, it really isn't that significant. So what I'm saying is what was significant about that trial is the, or the second trial and what really made it the outcome turned really on the fact that the witnesses, none of them had that fear that was clearly palpable in the first trial. Even now, 30 years after the trials of Eddie Nash, Scott Thorson looks back and claims victory, though there was never a guilty verdict. His suggestion being that the trial not only cost Nash two years in prison, but destroyed his drug organization. I took his ass down. I cost Eddie Nash a lot of money. And that's the only way I could pay him back. I cost him over three, $4 million in, in attorney fees. Uh, he lost everything. Um, he, uh, he, he was incarcerated for a long time. Uh, they destroyed him. They destroyed him. The police department destroyed him. Regardless of the costs, Eddie Nash was now free and seemingly invincible when it came to the Wonderland murders. The rule of double jeopardy prevented him from ever being tried for the murders again. Or did it? When we come back with episode 7, we'll tell the story of how a moment of bragging between an Armenian mobster and an undercover federal agent would result in the Wonderland case coming back to haunt Eddie Nash one more time. He goes, I'm the one that paid off the juror that got him acquitted. So when we hear this, we're going... Well, this is, this is a twist that we didn't expect. I'm Michael Connolly, and you have been listening to The Wonderland Murders and the Secret History of Hollywood, an audible original produced by Miziger Content. I want to thank all those who agreed to be interviewed, especially Tom Lang and Mac McLean. And a big thank you to retired LAPD homicide detective Mike Thies, who assisted us in getting a note about this podcast into the LAPD retiree website. As a result, many of the interviews you've heard came from the retired detectives and officers making contact with the production team to tell their stories. Another big thank you to Bob Shern, who headed up the district attorney's organized crime unit at the time of the Wonderland murders and was instrumental in helping us set the focus of the podcast. The archives of the Los Angeles Times, where I once worked, were also very useful in recounting the twists and turns of the Wonderland case. And lastly, thank you to actor Scott Clays, who gave us the voice of the prosecution in the reading of the Wonderland memo. The executive producers of the podcast are Nick Gilhol, Jen Casey, Kristen Lang, Rick Jackson, and myself. Post-production supervision and editing by Terrell Lee Langford. The music is composed and performed by Eamon Welliver. For Audible, the Acquisition Development and Production Council are John Curlin and Josh Gordon. Vice President of Audible Studios is Mike Charzuk. Editor-in-Chief of Audible Originals is David Blum. Copyright 2021 by Miziger Content, LLC. Sound recording copyright 2021 by Audible Originals, LLC. Thanks for listening. Episode 7 is next. Thank you.